I just wanted to say as well, when we gaze upon an exquisite piece of art or listen to beautiful music, I really feel that an opportunity arises to connect with the original artist, often in the most profound way because you're potentially firing the same neurons that the artist did when they created it. We make new neural pathways and stimulate a state of inspiration. And as we mirror the original artist's emotions, we immediately experience something called empathetic resonance, which actually connects us to the artist. The artist could be deceased and it would still connect us to the artist. So in that sense, you know, we never really die. We then feel what the artist felt when they created that piece. Not only do we feel a deep connectedness when we review that piece or we listen to some music, but also um, we experience an elevated state of consciousness. So this sense of being drawn into a painting or drawn into a piece of music is sometimes referred to as embodied cognition, which is the mind and the body connected. We can experience empathetic resonance in visual, kinesthetic or auditory acuities. Listening to music will often trigger a visual acuity as well, or a kinesthetic feeling sense, or a kinesthetic acuity. So the listening part of us will then trigger something visual or something feeling. So for me, this really cements the theory that we are all very much connected and we are all one consciousness. So I really feel that art proves that, that we're all connected. And when I close my eyes, the inside, I've never had a trip like this since, but I was in the dark. I could see I was in the dark, but I was going toward the light because there was this curling kind of mother of pearl like conch shell thing and I was in a, like a tunnel with a light coming just from around the, the side and it was awesome because it was that was it of course this was God this was the light was God and I knew that even if I was in the dark I was going toward the light and I saw that all the shades of gray connect both those opposites and so I changed my name to gray right then so my art has always been kind of trying to integrate the uh, spectrum of reality into a more holistic picture of the transdimensional, the visionary, and the transcendental. Because the transcendental art traditions, you know, the, all the sacred arts of all the different world, visionary cultures, because all religion comes from the mystical experience, and that's a visionary experience. And you see it through all the uh, the mosques are beautifully ornamentally patterned from the same visionary mindscape that a DMT user would recognize. And the same thing goes for the great Christian masterpieces. And all through uh, world religion, there are these waves that have crystallized into these visionary uh, experiences of angels, of demons, of all kinds of worlds, and they're really, it's, it's the thing that connects all the world religions is sacred art. And so we started thinking like, wow, there needs to be a new kind of sacred art that integrates this visionary dimension of where all, all cultures emanate from, the true visionary cultures emanate from this. You see it in the Shipibos, you see it in uh, the Huichole, you see it in uh, so many of these patterns. That the root word of psychedelics means to manifest the soul. And for me now, I mean, I haven't even done psychedelics in like four years, but for me, how I manifest my soul or my consciousness is doing this these artworks on minds. That the prototypic figure for the artist, as well as for the scientist, is the shaman. The shaman 
is the figure at the beginning of human history that unites the doctor, the scientist, and the artist into a single notion of caregiving and creativity. Caregiving and creativity. I think that, you know, to whatever degree art over the past several centuries has wandered in the desert, it is because this shamanic function has been either suppressed or forgotten. And we've, uh, different images of the artist have been held up at different times. The artist as artisan, the artist as handmaiden of a ruling class or family, the artist as designer for the production of integrated objects into a civilization. This notion of the artist as mystical journeyer, as one who goes into a world unseen by others and then returns to tell them of it, was pretty much lost in the post-medieval uh, and Renaissance conception of art up until the late 19th century or early 20th century, where, beginning with the Romantics, there is a new permission to explore the irrational. There is a new permission to explore the irrational. This really is the bridge back to the archaic shamanic function of the artist permission to explore the irrational. The Romantics did it with their um, elevation of titanic emotion, romantic love specifically. The symbolists in the mid-19th century did it by a re-emphasis on the emotional content of the image and a rejection of the previous rationalism. And that emphasis on the image and on the emotions set the stage then for what I take to be the, the truly shamanic movements in art, which begin really with Alfred Jarry in the late 1880s and early 1890s. Jarry, you may remember, was the founder of something called the Ecole du Pataphysique, the Pataphysical College. Jari announced, pataphysics is the science. The problem was, nobody could understand what it meant or what it stood for, including Jari. <laughs> See, this was a true effort to bend the boundaries of art, to create new permission, permission really for the unthinkable. And this, uh, again, reinforces the shamanic function what do we mean when we say the unthinkable? We mean the envelope of that which can be conceived. And for uh, at least 200 years, the ostensible mission of the artist has been to test the conceptual and imagistic envelope of what the society is willing to tolerate. And this has taken many forms the uh, deconstruction of imagery that we get with abstract expressionism going back into impressionism and the point of it, or uh, the permission for the irrational imagery of the unconscious, surrealism, and, uh, and German expressionism make use of this permission. Always the idea of being to somehow destroy the idols of the tribe. Dissolve the conceptual boundary of ordinary expectation. Well, in order to do this, it seems to me there is a precondition for the creation of art, which I call understanding. And I don't mean this in an intellectual sense. 
I mean it in the sense that Alfred North Whitehead intended when he defined understanding as the apperception of pattern as such. As such. There's nothing more to it than that. You see, if we were to look at this room and we were to squint our eyes and uh, I'm doing this right now and I see that the room divides itself into people dressed in red and people dressed in blue. This is a pattern and it tells me something about what I'm looking at. Now I shift my depth of field. Now I'm looking at where men are sitting and where women are sitting. This is a different pattern and it tells me more about what I am looking at. The number of these patterns theoretically present in any construction is infinite. That says to me then that the depth of understanding cannot be known. It cannot be known. Everything is eminent. William Blake makes this point, you know, that you can see infinity in a grain of sand. So, um, Nikki, kind of going into to what you were saying about externalizing or, or expressing consciousness, art, this communion, the, the mirroring of neurons, um, you want to touch on that? Yeah. One of the things I wanted to say about, you know, the amazing thing about art and art therapy as well, is being sort of more recognised now as a, you know, a real tangible thing, is that there are some people that aren't very good at being empathetic or connecting with other people or some people struggle to see beyond what's going on, what's going on around them. You know, to some extent, we're all like that. You know, we all see and perceive things from our own perspective. So in that sense, we're all the same, you know, selfish, I guess, in, in the sense that we just see things from our perspective. The beauty of art, you know, whether it's music or visual art, it develops the ability to empathise. You know, it wakens up the consciousness and, and opens up up in the sense that we see something and it fires fires us off you know it fires off those neurons which is like the mirror neurons so you know we see something and it fires off stuff in our brain we experience a feeling of some sort of sensory feeling whether it's a kinesthetic feelings you know in the pit of our belly that feeling sense or it could trigger a, a visual thing so it can develop empathy in people, whereas before they may not, not have had an ability to, to have empathy. Let me ask you a question. Has anything ever happened to you that you couldn't explain? That made you feel sort of foolish when you tried to tell somebody about it? Well, if it has, have plenty of company, as you'll soon see. And what it is, is nothing less than a tremendous explosion of creativity. And what it is, is nothing less than a tremendous explosion of creativity. What it is, is nothing less than a tremendous explosion of creativity and aesthetic self-expression on the part of the human species. For me, the glory of the human animal is cognitive activity, song, dance, sculpture, Poetry. For me, the glory of the human animal is cognitive activity, song, dance, sculpture, poetry.
for me, the glory of the human animal is cognitive activity, song, dance, sculpture, poetry. And what would we say of time? The time of our lives and the time of our observations. Khalil Gibran might say, you would measure time, the measureless and the immeasurable. You would adjust your conduct and even direct the course of your spirit according to the hours and seasons. Of time, you would make a stream upon whose bank you would sit and watch it flowing. Yet the timeless in you is aware of life's timelessness. And knowing that yesterday is but today's memory and tomorrow is today's dream. And that which sings and contemplates in you is still dwelling within the bounds of the first moment which scattered the stars into space. Who among you does not feel that his power to love is boundless? And yet who does not feel that very love? So boundless, encompassed within the center of his being, and moving not from love thought to love thought, nor love deed to other love deed. And is not time even as love is, undivided and spaceless? But if in your thought you must measure time into seasons, let each of us a season encircle all the other seasons, and let today's embrace the past with the remembrance and the future with longing. And let today's embrace the past with the remembrance and the future with longing. And let today's embrace the past with the remembrance and the future with longing. When power corrupts, poetry cleanses. When power leads man towards ignorance, poetry reminds him of his limitations. When power narrows the area of man's concern, poetry reminds him of the richness and diversity of existence. When power corrupts, poetry cleanses. On the one hand, we have the immediacy and flavor of our lives, or poetry, music, art, and mysticism. And on the other, the objective discoveries and explanations of science. On the other one, there is excitement, beauty, and wonder. And on the other, possibility that consciousness is an epiphenomenon of certain complex electrochemical reactions, that life is the product of random molecular processes, and the universe is an accident. There appears, therefore, to be an unbridgeable gap between the objective and the subjective approaches to the question of the universe and our role within it. There seems at first sight to be no way in which the theories of science can be spiced. To be no way in which the theories of science can be spiced with the flavour of human experience. Or that a poetic insight could be transformed into the rigour of scientific objectivity. These two worlds appear to be simply too far apart. It is, however, my argument that a bridge can indeed be built between interior and exterior worlds and that synchronicity provides us with a starting point for it represents a tiny flaw in the fabric of all that we have hitherto taken for reality for it represents a tiny flaw in the fabric of all that we have hitherto taken for reality synchronicities give us a glimpse beyond our conventional notions of time and causality into the immense patterns of nature. The underlying dance which connects all things and the mirror which is suspended between inner and outer universes. With synchronicity as our starting point, it becomes possible to begin the construction of a bridge that spans the worlds of mind and matter, 
metaphysics and psyche. And I think it was the pursuit of beauty that served me best. Beauty is beauty, that's all there is to it. If you're interested in you, then you're stuck with you and stuck with your death. But if you get interested in beauty, then you launch on something mysterious inside your soul that grows like a secret of St. Thought and overtakes completely when you die and you're in. Well, it traditionally, meaning since the invention of print, the artist has had this role where the eccentricity and the bohemian lifestyle and so forth of the artist was tolerated because the argument was the artist is a kind of antenna for this mysterious thing called the future and the artist would sound the alarm and bring the news. Beauty is beauty, that's all there is to it. If you're interested in you, then you're stuck with being stuck with your dead. But if you get interested in beauty, then you launch onto something mysterious inside your soul that grows and grows like a secret of the same thought that overtakes you completely until you die and you're in. And I've always been interested in beauty. And I've always been interested in beauty. It's a shuddering situation. It's hard to let go of yourself and have a good time with beauty. Isn't there yet another way to get a handle on this? And the answer is yes, but I'm not sure it's easier. It may seem at first easier, but that is aesthetic. The imagination must serve the ideal of the beautiful. The imagination must serve the ideal of the beautiful. Now you see, beauty is beauty. That's all there is to it. If you're interested in you, then you're stuck with you and stuck with your death. But if you get interested in beauty, then you launch onto something mysterious inside your soul that grows and like a secret of same thought and overtakes completely when you die and you're it. That which is taste is to be avoided at all costs. And 90% of the difficulty in your intellectual life would never have happened if you had just had better taste. We're all brought up to scheme and battle to make it in the here and now with gold, love, and power, clothes, and a face that anyone from our mother to the next door neighbor cop can see and respect. But it is entirely possible that we can make everyone a king and we will still have bullies and uh, slaves. And the addressing of the economic disparity doesn't change the structure of the human soul. Then we will have to go deeper. And I don't know how this is going to look. There's a lot of tension in any community that discusses this kind of stuff over what, where the body lies in all of this. Can we solve our problems and maintain our individual existences? See, beauty is beauty. That's all there is to it. If you're interested in yourself, then you're stuck with yourself. You're stuck with your death. But if you get interested in beauty, then you launch onto something mysterious inside your soul that grows like a secret of the same thought and overtakes completely. It is going to define, to redefine what it is to be human. I think technologies are neither gods nor demons, it's what you do with it. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, dragging themselves through the Negro streets at dawn looking for an angry fix, angel-headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavenly connection to the starry dynamo in the machinery of night. Who poverty and tatters and hollow-eyed and high sat up smoking in the supernatural darkness of cold water flats floating across the tops of cities contemplating jazz. We're all brought up to scheme and meme and battle to make it in the here and now. We're gold, lovers, power, clothes, money, power. In a sense, we don't do this kind of talk anymore because 
this is the future. You know, we have become the very thing our parents warned us against. It's a shuddering situation. It's hard to let go of yourself and to have a good time with beauty. We're all brought up to scheme and battle to make it here in the now with gold, lovers, power, clothes, and a face that anyone from our mother to the next door neighbor cop can see and respect. At least create a world where those who aspire to transcendence are not blocked in the aspiration. Who bared their brains to heaven under the L and saw Mohammedan angels staggering on tenement roofs illuminated. Who passed through universities with radiant, cool eyes hallucinating Arkansas and Blake light tragedy among the scholars of war who were expelled from the academies for crazy and publishing obscene odes on the windows of the skull, who cowered in unshaven rooms in underwear, burning their money in waste baskets and listening to the terror through the wall, who got busted in their pubic beards returning through Laredo with a belt of marijuana for New York, who ate fire in paint hotels or drank turpentine in Paradise Alley, death, or purgatoried their torsos night after night with dreams, with drugs, with waking nightmares, alcohol and cock and endless balls, incomparable blind streets of shuddering cloud and lightning in the mind leaping toward poles of Canada and Patterson, illuminating all the motionless world of time between. Peyote solidities of halls, backyard green tree cemetery dorms, wine drunkenness over the rooftops, storefront burrows of tea head joyride, neon blinking traffic light, sun and moon and tree vibrations in the roaring winter dusks of Brooklyn, ash can rantings and kind king light of mind who chained themselves to subways for the endless ride from Battery to Holy Bronx on Benzedrine until the noise of wheels and children brought them down shuddering mouth racked and battered bleak of brain all drained of brilliance in the drear light of zoo The dilemma of human freedom is that we don't we don't know where we rest in the universal hierarchy of uh, good and evil. In other words, what would we do if we could do anything? Would our transcendent impulses drive us to a kind of angelhood? Or, as James Joyce says, would we flop on the scene side? And the answer normally given is some would do one and some the other. Yes, but what if we erase that possibility of individual action and is there then only one destiny? And then what shall it be and who shall decide? I would be fairly pessimistic if I saw this all going on on a level playing field. But it isn't going on a level playing field. Transcendence is favored. See beauty, beauty, that's all there is to it. If you're interested in you, then you're stuck with you, and you're stuck with it there. But if you get interested in beauty, then you launch onto something mysterious inside your soul that grows like a secret of same thought. It overtakes completely when you die, and you're it. You do not have to sell out to any form of airheadism. You can be as tight-assed as you want. You can be as hard-nosed as you want. You can be as demanding, analytical, rational as you want. And the thing is bigger than you are. It'll just take you apart. It'll make you weep like a baby. So there's nothing about faith and sensitivity and reaching. And, uh, no, no, no. When it comes, you know, it kicks in the front door and takes you prisoner. <laughs> it's, uh, so, uh... This is the way to get somewhere. You'll never get anywhere if you believe in stuff because, you know, it'll take you six months to work through Babaji and then you have to go on to somebody else and life is just not long enough to give all these guys uh, a crack at your enlightenment. And the great vindication is then that when you behave like that, 
when you take that stance, which you would expect would betray you into nihilism, depression, and so forth. Instead, no, that works. That's the method. Then the goal, you know, reject everything but gold. And you know what gold is? It looks like gold. It feels like gold. It's not something you have to... I mean, I'm amazed at what thin soup is dished out as spiritual food. Uh, and it's because we are, as individuals, conflicted. Now it's a shuddering situation. It's hard to let go of yourself and have a good time. We're all brought up to scheme, battle, make it in the here and now. Lovers, power, clothes and a face that anyone from your mother to the next certain cop can see and respect. But in the long run, we're going to have to give up and drop dead and enter beauty. In fact, beauty is what kills us. Beauty is a great mirror. Get used to it earlier and it'll save us all from a life of phony nightmare. Life is a nightmare for most who want to see something else, but what is not life offers freely. People want a lesser fake of beauty, something transient, faulty, a hot dog that is doomed to disappear in the blink of an eye. Any old grandma would tell you. This is a lot of nutty raving, but it needs to be said. If people want to hassle about the faith in the next 10 years, what will happen is that we'll grow older, nearer to death. Fail children, right phones, right cars, see Paris or Moscow. And I think it was the pursuit of beauty that served me best. Because uh, when I was a kid, first I started out collecting rocks, and then I collected butterflies. And then in my emergent phallic phase, I was an amateur rocketeer. And the major thrill there was setting off these explosive fuels and watching the possibility of shrapnel and all this stuff. And, and, I, and then as I got into rockets, I got into science fiction. And science fiction, I really consider a proto-psychedelic drug because what science fiction does is it gives permission to imagine says try it this way this way this way and then you get as a kid you get the idea you know that anything is possible that's what science fiction teaches you the weight of the world is love under the burden of solitude under the burden of dissatisfaction the weight the weight we carry is love Nature is, seems to be in the business of building systems which transcend themselves. It's of building systems which transcend themselves. We can see that as far back in time as we care to look and throughout all of nature. So it seems like we actually have a hell of a tailwind helping us toward the transcendent other. Probably that is what will make the difference. We couldn't have done it by ourselves, but we happen to be in a universe which is itself involved in the process of bootstrapping to higher levels. Who can deny? In dreams, it touches the body. In thought, constructs a miracle. In imagination, anguishes, till born in human looks out of the heart burning with purity, for the burden of life is love. Plato felt that, that the world was approached through three paths, the good, the true, and the beautiful, but that goodness is controversial, and truth difficult to discern, but that beauty has a kind of resonant self-evidence. That beauty has a kind of resonant self-evidence. And so, following beauty, it's my faith, will lead to the good and the true. And some beauty is, I mean, I'm a fan of extreme forms of beauty. Uh, Hieronymus Bosch and Redon and James Ensor. I mean, the beautiful can be grotesque. Of course, this then opens up a, a whole aesthetic can of worms that maybe we don't want to get into. Well, beautiful art is never bad. 
The beauty of the grotesque is the unique modern contribution to the discussion of beauty. And it's a higher form of perception. I mean, it's all very fine to find beauty in wild flowers and human dancing and diaphanous dresses and harpsichord music. And it's quite another to find beauty in ripped up railway tickets and found objects and smashed machinery and, and that sort of thing. The modern sensibility has been unsentimental and has, in that sense, I think, advanced the canon of view. Modernity, I'm feeling much better about now that it's over. You know, it's such a huge enterprise to look back on. You know, I mean, uh, what faith, what simplicity, what naivete those people possess. I, I can hardly get over it. The 20th century, for all of its brutality and its uh, flirtation with the, the dark side of the human soul, <clears throat> the counterpoint to that was its incredible optimism and idealism and, it, and simplicity. But we carry the weight wearily, and so must rest in the arms of love at last, must rest in the arms of love. No rest without love, no sleep without dreams of love. Be mad or chill, obsessed with angels or machines, the final wish is love. Cannot be bitter, cannot deny, cannot withhold if denied. The weight is too heavy, must give for no return as thought is given in solitude in all the excellence of its excess. The warm bodies shine together in the darkness. The hand moves to the center of the flesh. The skin trembles in happiness, and the soul comes joyful to the eye. Yes, yes, that's what I wanted. I always wanted. I always wanted to return to the body where I was born.